And, you know, this is the only truth right here. In a dying world that's looking for truth, this is the truth right here. Say, this is the Bible, the indestructible, the infallible, living word of God. He wrote it, and I believe it. My mind is focused. My heart is open. My spirit is ready to receive it now. I will never be the same. I will be forever changed. In Jesus' most precious name. And everyone said, amen. Amen. Keep standing with me this morning. We're going to read our scripture. In 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 17. We just got two verses this morning. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 16 to 17. You can also look on the screen with me. And let's read it together. The count of three. Ready? One, two, three. Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away. Be old, all things have become new. This is the word of God. Let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word is truth. And it's your word that opens our eyes to the darkness of this world, God. We thank you, Lord, that being a new creation in you, we can identify and we can see things and distinguish light from darkness. We can distinguish from righteousness and sin. And we thank you because of your spirit that resides in us. This morning, God, we pray again that you would transform us from glory to glory by your word. And as your messenger, I humble myself. God, I give everything to you. For we ask it in Jesus' name we pray. And everyone said, amen. You know, it's actually fitting the way God works things out. Last week, we just finished our message, The Purpose of life, And that the purpose of life is because of what God has done for us. I want to live my life for him. Amen. And it was so fitting because coming back from Vegas, and I'm not knocking Vegas because I think it's great to eat there. There's a lot of great shows, a lot of great entertainment. But the one thing that Vegas is all about, it's all about excess. Say excess. It's just more and more. It's, it's all about indulging, right? When you think about Vegas, you think indulging, indulging in food, indulging in entertainment, indulging in things that you shouldn't be doing. It's all indulging. More is more sin, more sin. What do they call it? Sin city, right? And it was fitting to to come back from there because I realized that there's a lot of people that are just distracted in life. And the one thing the enemy wants to do to you is distract you. People sit there for hours and hours at the tables and at the slots. And I'm thinking, man, they've probably there, been all, there all day. And the whole point of the enemy, you've probably heard it before, his whole thing is this. He wants to fool you to think that he's not real so that he can entrap you, right? Life, your life is like you're in a cell. The door is open to that cell, but you don't want to walk out until one day that, that jail cell closes. And in life, the enemy wants you to get into a comfort zone to where you think everything is fine, everything is good. As long as, as, long as I'm going to church, as long as I claim to be Christian, then I'm, I'm just above the threshold. Then I'm, I'm just all right. I'm above par. But the thing is, God never called you to be just okay or just, just right as a Christian. God called you to be the light of the world and salt of the earth. God didn't call us to be mediocre Christians. God didn't call us to be spectators. God called us to get in the game. God called us to be on the field and and, and moving for the Lord. But the thing is, many churches will treat you like, hey, you're just there, an audience, and we're here to entertain you. That's not what church is. Church is a family. And in a family, everyone has a responsibility, right? And at a very young age, I learned as part of a church that I should never just be a spectator, but I should be someone who's always serving because that's where I find purpose. 
You know, it, it blesses my heart to see people set up and help break down. Even if you're, you're not skilled at certain things yet, you know, maybe you don't know how to do something, but maybe you could just lift a bag. Maybe you can put away a chair. You know, things like that shows the heart of a servant. And I tell you, God honors that. You know, what I love about renovation, when you talk about renovation, how many people are in the middle of renovation right now? Anybody? <laughs> how many people want to do a renovation but don't have enough money? Okay, there you go. We always want to renovate, right? Renovation, it takes, if anything, it takes time. It's a process. It's tedious. It's tiresome. But the result is satisfying, right? Even if you did room by room, even if you just painted the room, it looks so much different. It's satisfying. Even if you just move some furniture around, things like that, it's satisfying to see things renovated. But the most satisfying is not just a renovation. The most satisfying is a transformation. Say transformation. I love it when builders will tear it apart. I mean, they'll just tear everything apart. They'll gut it out. They'll only leave the frame. And they don't actually restore it, but they're actually transforming it. They're rebuilding it, and they're creating something new. It's the same frame, but it's a new creation. And you think... You think it's coincidence that, that Jesus, <laughs> what was his occupation? You think it was coincidence that Jesus was a carpenter? I don't think it was coincidence. You know why? Because the same God who created the heavens and the universe, the same God who created you is the same God building things and creating things. He created the universe. He created you. And maybe life beat you up. Maybe your life feels run down. Maybe your life needs a complete overhaul, but Jesus is the master builder. And Jesus can create something new if you allow him to, to take control of your life. So just picture your life right now as that house. What, what Jesus wants to do is he wants to gut it out. Your furniture from the 1980s, your wallpaper from the 1970s, your carpet that you haven't changed for 20 years. He wants to rip everything out of this home, and he wants to transform you. And in our passage today, the Apostle Paul says, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old, right? The old is gone. Take that big dump truck, Let's gut it out. Let's throw all the junk and take that truck away. The old has gone and the new has come. And when we talk about Jesus transforming us from glory to glory, it's a process. You're not going to go from new Christian to mature Christian and overnight. It's going to take time. And all of us are WIP. Say WIP. Turn to your partner and say, you whip. You know what whip means? A work in progress. We're all work in progress. So don't feel bad that you're not perfect. You know why? Because you will never be perfect. Only Jesus is perfect. But one day when he takes us home and he transforms us to his glory, then that will be the time we'll be perfect in paradise. But little by little, he's transforming us. Why is it that as human nature, we love to see that process of transformation? We delight in watching progression over and over again. And it's evident by the popularity of renovation shows or HGTV shows. And you see things of what it, before and after. You know, I love seeing pictures before and after. So whenever you do a renovation of, of a room, take a picture before and then take a picture after. You know, when we, we do our setup, you can take a picture before and then take a picture after. You see what God can do in a matter of minutes, right? In a matter of an hour. We simply can't get enough of seeing the old and ugly become new and beautiful. Why? Could it be that perhaps we're drawn to the process because it reflects the very work of God that he does in our lives? When we receive Christ as Savior, we exchange our old life for a new one. We exchange sin for forgiveness. We exchange pride for humility. We exchange legalism for grace. We exchange fear for love. We exchange weakness for strength. We exchange anger for joy. 
And only God can make us new and whole. And that's why this morning I've entitled my message, A New Creation. Say, A New Creation. And the Apostle Paul shares with us how we are truly transformed in Christ and what it truly means to be a new creation. You can't just say, I'm a new creation and nothing changes. You can't say, hey, come over to my house. I, got, I renovated my house. And they come to your house and they're like, nothing's changed. Then it's all just words. There's no proof. There's no evidence. And in our passage today, it says, therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. We don't know him in that way. No longer is it just physical, but because Christ now resides in us, he has a grip on our soul. He has a grip on our life spiritually. And therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old things have passed away, and behold, all things have become new. And whenever you see the first word, look, look at the scripture. What is the first word? Whenever you see therefore, you have to ask, what is it there for? That's the whole point, because it's connecting to the previous passage. When we see, therefore, so what is that there for? Last week, last week, we talked about the purpose of life. We're still in the same passage as last week. And we learned that in Christ, we know that we're no longer to live for ourselves, but for him. So now, since we live our lives for Christ, we don't operate on the focus of the flesh. I'm not thinking about only the physical and the material and the possessions. The most important thing to me now is being transformed from the inside out spiritually. It's all about spiritually. So when you are surrendered spiritually, that's the only time you can overcome physically. You can't overcome physical with physical. When it comes to like, oh man, I want to give up this addiction. You can't overcome that physical addiction by striving harder physically. Because that is something that has to be transformed from the inside out. When the spiritual is changed, then you have the empowerment to overcome the physical. Let me give you an example. When I was young, 8th, ninth grade, I had a favorite word to use. It started with an F. It's not family, but it was a bad word. And I used to say it all the time. My parents didn't know. But when I'm at school, when I'm out with my friends, every line would have an F word. And when I got saved at 15 years old, when, when I gave my life to Jesus, when I understood that he's everything to me, when I understood that I need his forgiveness, that I need his love and salvation, some people have... A transformation where it takes time. And some people have a transformation when you lay it all down. And you say, God, I'm just recklessly abandoned. Everything is yours. Those kind of transformations are real as well. And when I gave my life to Christ, he took that from me. And it's not the fact that I didn't want to swear anymore. It's the fact that the, the, the tongue got sanctified. And I felt God speaking into my life. And this was before I played instruments. I couldn't even sing. You know, I was doing a little bit of rapping. And then when I gave all that to God, that's when he began to, to blossom the gifting that he puts in your life. And he sanctified that tongue. Now, there's times where you stub your toe and you blurt it out. Oh, forgive me, God. <laughs> you know, sometimes like you're driving all this. Mother, father. Right? I, remember, I remember in high school when, when my tongue got sanctified. I was a sophomore, and I remember clearly. We were with my friends, and, and I, I said, oh, man, fudge. And they, they all stopped. They all stopped and looked at me. They go, ah! <laughs> They started laughing at me like, what is fudge? How come you don't say the real word anymore? And by the end of my sophomore year, guess what? All my friends were starting to go to Christian club. It was cool. <laughs> one by one, they started to see God's transformation in my life. And God can transform you, sure. He could transform you right away and sanctify your tongue. But it, it's a process in life. It's a process. And here we see from last week that God now is 
a purpose that we live for. Now we don't know Christ just by the physical body, but we know him by the spirit that lives with us. That when we confess Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, a person is transformed from the inside out, not the outside in. And Paul is telling us that you are tr not truly changed until your heart is changed. You can change the outside. You can get a haircut. I was looking at Jose today. Look at Jose. He looks so handsome with his shaved beard. I didn't recognize him. Sorry to put you on the spot, Jose. Right? Look at Ethan with a brand new haircut. Woo! See, you could transform this, but it's just the physical, right? You could get buff. You could transform your body, but it's just the physical. But it all has to start here in the spiritual. Say spiritual. So a person is transformed from the inside out, not the outside in. And Paul is telling us now that if anyone, therefore, if what? Anyone. Anyone. Doesn't matter what race you are. Doesn't matter where you come from. It doesn't matter your status, your age, your education, or your flaws. It says if anyone is what? In Christ. If anyone is in Christ, if anyone receives that invitation from Christ and understands that his sacrifice and his gift of salvation is for those who surrender their lives to him, it says, if anyone is in Christ, what? He is a new creation. He or she is a new creation. Now listen, the saved are not just forgiven and saved. Okay, it doesn't stop there as a Christian. That's just like, yeah, that's what we receive. That's one of the greatest things you could ever receive. You're saved and you're forgiven. But it doesn't stop there. It says that you are a new creation. See, would it be enough if God just said, yeah, you're saved, you're forgiven, you can go to heaven. You know, that would be enough. But listen what God is doing here. He doesn't just forgive you. He doesn't just save you. But he transforms you. Because he doesn't want you to just to remain what you are. He wants you to become what he's destined you to be. And we're all called to transform from glory to glory. I know people who push drugs. I know people who are addicts. And, and when they surrender their life to God, that was the only time they were able to remove and break that habit. Only God can do that. I remember uh, 20 years ago when we went to our first like Promise Keepers men's event. And I saw guys there, man, tatted up, huge biker dudes ripped up and those are the kind of guys that you don't you, when you walk and you see them you you walk the other way because you don't want any you don't want any part of them and i saw these huge dudes you know worshiping jesus and crying like babies and i remember had had a chance to talk with one guy and he was telling me how you know he used to be in that life that gang life he used to do drugs and he, he shares about what jesus did for him now he just wants to speak about jesus right that's all he wants to do is share the love of God. I've seen people even in this generation, just a couple weeks ago, it's awesome, in Florida, they had this big event uh, where former homosexuals were getting together in the name of Jesus who were saved from that lifestyle. And a lot of people say, oh, man, you know, that's not, that's not, not something that we, uh, that we choose. It's something that we're ingrained with. You know why people say that? Because they're thinking about their physical more than the spiritual. They haven't discovered spiritually why they're created. So they get confused with what they are physically. And there was a big event in Florida where Christians came together who were freed from that lifestyle. Now, was it, was it an easy transformation? No. It's going to take time. It's going to take surrender. And, and a lot of times in our life, you don't want to give up something, whether it's drugs, whether it's alcohol, whether it's pornography, whether it's gambling. We don't want to let go of those things, right? Because our flesh is like, but, you know, my flesh wants it. But that's the problem because we're operating in our flesh. And if we're operating in our flesh, we're not allowing the spirit to take over, to combat against it. I'll tell you right now, I am a believer that when the Spirit is, is overtaking you, when the Spirit is in control of your life, you're able to overcome those temptations. But if you're not filled with the Spirit, that temptation is going to come and you're going to fall to it. But God has made it 
possible that if you have the Holy Spirit, that's why you got to get in His Word. That's why you got to be surrounded by other Christians and held accountable in church. Because if we're not, we will be lost. If you don't have brothers and sisters around you, if you're not committed and, and, and attending church faithfully, if you're not getting into His Word faithfully, it's so easy to give in to those temptations. Our mind is so easily skewed. Look at the media. We, we read something. We watch a video. We believe it right away without even looking if there's second or third reports that support the report. Right? Like what's going on right now in the politics, one story comes out. Make sure before you pull the trigger on something and you believe something, make sure you go to the second and third, fourth and fifth reports, making sure that it's supported. And in our life, we have to make sure that we are in the spirit of God. Can I get an amen? You can't change your lifestyle by changing it by the physical, only by the spiritual. That's operating in the flesh versus operating in the spirit. Now, is surrender easy? No. It's hard. No one likes to surrender. And God doesn't want you to surrender because you're forced to. God wants you to surrender because you choose to. Be because I tell you this, it's either we surrender on our own choice now, or one day every tongue will confess and every knee will bow down that Christ is Lord. What he's saying there is those Christians, those believers, when Jesus comes, every tongue will confess and knee will bow down and say, Jesus, you're my Lord and Savior. And the ones that don't believe him will still bow down and confess, wow, he was the Savior and now my life is lost. Either way, we will bow down to God. But it's your choice to bow down on your own choice or bow down because you're forced to on that day of reckoning. But surrender is no, not easy. Does it take sacrifice? Absolutely. That, that's the hardest part, the initial step. The hardest part of giving anything up is giving it up, the first part. And once you do, when you actually say, God, I don't need this. I don't want this anymore. Take it from me. Empower me to overcome it. And God will. But it's going to take time. It's going to be a process. It's going to take accountability. But if you come to God and ask him for strength, he will give it. If you draw close to him, what does he promise? I'll draw close to you. Draw close to me. I will draw close to you. Sin doesn't take a day off. The enemy doesn't take days off. It just goes 24-7. Sin never takes a day off. The enemy will never stop bugging you. And that's why we need to be prepared to combat against the work of the enemy. He's going to keep attacking, but we just keep transforming to be more like Jesus. And listen, if you stay close to Jesus, you're a good shepherd, and you walk with him every step of the way, and you're consistent in your walk, the enemy will constantly be chasing you because you're constantly moving. And the believer now, see, before we were a believer, we attach ourselves to sin. We look for sin. Okay? Before we were believers, we look for sin. You give someone money at, on a late night, chances are he's going to sin. Nothing good happens late at night, right? You ever had nothing to do, right? And your flesh just wants to sin. If you're left alone and no one knows where you are and what you're doing and you've got a pocket full of money, I, bet, I, I guarantee you, your flesh is going to tell you, do something. Do something because no one's watching anyway. And that's how the enemy works. He wants you to sin, he wants you to watch things that you shouldn't be watching. He wants you to do things that you shouldn't be doing. That's how sin works. He will c continue to attack you. What's that quote? Idle hands are the devil's workshop or idle hands are the devil's playground. When you're not doing anything for God, that's the moment the enemy is going to come in and infiltrate. He's going to use what you have, not for God, but he's going to use it to destroy you. So that's why we have to stay close to Jesus. And as Jesus walks, you walk with him every step of the way. And if you're walking with Jesus, the enemy is going to have to keep chasing you. And you keep making him chase you. Because you're walking with Jesus. And that's how we're transformed. All things are in my rearview mirror. Now I'm moving ahead. I'm pushing forward. I'm looking ahead. And when you identify with Jesus, 
you identify with his death and his resurrection. And with Christ, you put death to death. The old things pass away. Now you have the power because of Christ's resurrection to overcome the old things. And sometimes the old things are going to try to creep up. It's trying to creep back up. And the, and the more you miss church and the more you miss reading the word of God and the more you miss praying to the Lord and worshiping, you feel the old guy trying to get back up. And it's your responsibility to kick that old fool down. Kick him down in Jesus' name. You read the word of God. You pray. You're surrounded by believers. And you keep kicking him down until the moment God transforms us into glory. Forever and ever. With Christ, you have new life. And the resurrection power is what brings that new life. Now that is transformation. And you know what? You should be the type of person who looks at yourself. Are you, have you grown the past year? If you can't look at your old photos and remember the old memories and say, man, I remember last year. Man, I'm totally different now. You know, I'm, last year my mind was in the wrong place. My mind was in the gutter, man. But now I got saved. I got baptized. I'm serving. You should be confident looking back at just one year and say, wow, look how much I've grown. I was attending Bible study. Man, I really I feel like I understand now. You have to look back, and when I look back five years, ten years, I should say, wow, God, I am a work in progress, but you have brought me so far. And I look at all of you, and I know God has brought you so far, even in just the past few weeks, even in the past few months, even in the past year, or even in the past year and a half of existence of the cornerstone. I've seen all of you transform from glory to glory. You might not think you, you've grown that much. But when, you, when someone else sees you from their eyes. Like wow. You know it's my nephew's birthday. Happy birthday LJ. Let's give him a hand. But I look at LJ, I remember my sister, she was telling me, she's like, yeah, you know, LJ is really opening up when he's leading worship. You know, I've just seen him grow so much, right? And I don't know how he feels about it because he probably thinks, you know, I, I, I'm growing little by little. But from other people's point of view, they're like, wow, you've grown so much. And that's how people should see us. I want people to see the glory of God in me, not me. I want them to see the glory of Jesus. Wow, look at that guy. He's just on fire for God. It's contagious. I want to see Cornerstone to be such a contagious church. Like, I want people to know, like, oh, that guy's on fire for God. Look at them. Look at that family. They're on fire for Jesus. I don't want any one of us to have a reputation where, like, oh, that guy, yeah. <laughs> oh, that guy, he's just all talk. But when they talk about our church family, I want them to say, you know what? That's a church family that loves Jesus, on fire for Jesus. Some will give them praise in the house of God. That is transformation. That's the power of the Spirit of God transforming us from glory to glory. Look at this verse here in 2 Corinthians chapter 3, verse 18. It says, but we all with unveiled face beholding as a, in a mirror the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. But we all, with unveiled face, okay, what does unveiled face mean? That, that we don't have a covering anymore, okay? Beholding as in a mirror the glory of the Lord. You know, I always think of ourselves when we worship God or our lives, really we should be reflectors of God. In his word, it says that we should be imitators. But what I love to, to really look at it this way, I picture when I worship God, I picture that we're just mirrors. And that when his glory shines on us, it just bounces back, back to him. And that's what our life should be. To, to, in the most simplest way to say it is, I want to be a mirror for Jesus. I want his glory to shine on me and I want to shine it to others. I want to shine it back to him. I'm just a mirror of his glory. And we're being transformed into the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. How many of you watched that movie, Transformers? You know, growing up in the 80s, as an 80s kid, 
I was into Transformers. I was into G.I. Joe. How many people remember He-Man? Uh, I don't know, but when I watch it now, it's kind of ridiculous, though, right? But I used to be into He-Man, right? And some of the other ones, Thundercats and things like that. But Transformers was my favorite, right? And, you know, guess who my favorite character was? Optimus Prime. One shall stand and one will fall. I am Optimus Prime, leader of the Autobots. Autobots, transform! Right? Optimus Prime was the leader of the Autobots. And I remember watching when they, when they made the cartoon finally into movies in the late 2000s, right? The first movie, The Transformers, I remember Optimus Prime, what happens is like they're aliens from another planet or something. And they come down and they're just, they're just like, like a skeletal robot. They're, they don't have any form yet until they scan like a vehicle or something, right? They'll scan something and then they'll take the form of it, right? They'll transform it to the image of what they scan. And I'm going to show you a clip in a, in a minute where Optimus Prime... The only way to scan something else, the only way to transform into something else is you have to be close to it. Say close to it. So for Optimus Prime to take on the image of something else, you got to be close to it. In order for us to be like Jesus, we have to be close to him. You got to be close to him and you scan him and you transform into his glory and to his likeness. And in this clip, you're going to see where Optimus Prime scans. He's like this beat up, ugly old truck. And then he scans this nice truck. And you see him transform into a new image. Check out this clip. All Autobots. Calling all Autobots. That's awesome, right? You see him transform, and I'm thinking, man, you see, Optimus was on fire. And that's how we should be. As believers, we're transformed from glory to glory by drawing closer to Jesus. The only way for us to ch change and transform is to live close to Jesus. Walk with him. He's the closest, the most intimate relationship you can have on earth. Walk with him. Talk to him. Pray to him, right? Help me now, Lord. Help me, Jesus. Right. Speak to him like he's the, because he's the perfect father, right? Speak to him as, as you would envision a perfect father to be. That's what he is. And even more than your imagination of a perfect father. You can speak to him. You can ask him for strength, for wisdom, for clarity. You can ask him to move in your situation. So we will be transformed into the image of God. Though we're created by God in his image, sin tainted our view of ourselves. God created us uniquely and beautifully. It says that we are his masterpiece. We are his masterpiece. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. But what sin has done, it has tainted our perception of how we see ourselves. He wants us to get caught in depression. He wants us to get caught in anxiety. He wants us to get caught in the game of comparison because sin taints your perspective and the sin will destroy you. That whole perspective, the enemy doesn't want you to recognize that you're beautiful in the eyes of God. The enemy doesn't want you to recognize that you're created for greater things. He wants you to stay put where you are. And the moments those negative thoughts go in your mind, that's the enemy. He wants to keep you down. He wants to quiet you. Oh, no, don't, don't, don't shout for Jesus. Oh, oh, don't raise your hands and worship. Don't, people are going to look at you weird. Oh, don't clap your hands. People are going to look at you weird. And the moments that you feel that, do the exact opposite. When the enemy says, don't raise your hands, man, don't do it. I'm going to raise my hands. Hallelujah. The enemy says, don't clap your hands. I'm going to clap my hands louder. How's that, devil? You like that, right? you got to fight the devil with fire of Jesus. 
When, when, when the enemy says, oh, man, why don't you say a, a, a negative remark that, about that person? No. I'm going to give him a compliment. How you like that, devil? Boom. Roasted. Right? We got to fight the devil by, with righteousness. And it's those moments where, the, where God gives you that small window to recognize it. There's moments when you're about to argue or about to say something, you've got to bite your tongue and say, you know what? No, I'm doing the exact opposite. I am not going to be the devil's fool. You want to be the devil's fool? You want to be the devil's fool? You want to be controlled by the enemy? Then give in to what he wants. But if you say, no, man, I am not the devil's fool. I am a child of God. Someone give him praise in the house of God. So an incorrect view of God, it leads us to warped view of ourselves. But once the spirit of God lives within us, God begins to peel back the layers. You saw when Optimus Prime was, was peeling back the layers into this new creation. And, and when God is in your life, he begins to peel away the old habits. He peels away the old things and he replaces it with truth. Though the echoes of our old life will come calling... Though our old life will start to echo back and try to pull us back in, it doesn't have any more power over us unless you allow it to. But you're the one who, who has the choice to allow your old life to take over or not. Or you can stand firm in Jesus' name. And sometimes we fear that we haven't changed at all. But be rest assured, if you're walking with the Lord, you are not the same person you used to be. Transformation doesn't come easy. Though God is the one who does the work, we're the ones who are just called to surrender every area of our life, to be obedient to his will. And, it's, and if it seems like a battle, if it seems like a war zone, guess what? It's because it is. It's a battle. It's a war zone. Why do you think Paul said, put on the whole armor of God? Why? Because he knows that the enemy is going to come attacking. He's going to shoot his arrows at you. But it's your responsibility to hold up that shield and put on the whole armor of God. It's going to take for us to dig deep, to push back. And when times get tough, it's actually going to make you stronger. That is what building our faith is. That is what preparing our hearts is. When God allows us to be in that struggle... But know that even though you're in that struggle, you're an overcomer. Look at this last picture. I'm going to close with this. How many have heard the word metamorphosis before? Metamorphosis means transformation. And a lot of times, the perfect example of metamorphosis is the caterpillar turning into a beautiful butterfly. The amazing thing is, when you look, look at the first picture and the last picture, would you ever think that caterpillar could turn into something like a butterfly? If you didn't know what metamorphosis was, you would be like, there's no way. Totally different frame. One squishy. One is elegant, right? One crawls on the ground. The other one flies. You'd be like, there is no way that that... Could it turn into that? And you know, God has a sense of humor. God is so creative that sometimes I wonder he creates things really just to get his point across. Listen to this. In our verse today, it says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, okay, therefore, what is he talking about therefore? We're talking about no longer are we talking about the flesh. We're talking about the spirit. We're talking about being transformed by the spirit of God. So those that are being transformed in the spirit of God, therefore, he or she, if anyone is in Christ, he or she is a new creation. When you look at the original language in the Greek, the new creation is from this Greek word metamorpho. Metamorpho means transformation. Metamorphosis is taken from that word, metamorpho. 
God is saying in those moments of life, in the beginning stages when it's, life is hard and you're crawling through life, but the moment you give your life to God, he sets you up in his cocoon of love, in his cocoon of blessing. And it's a process. You might think that you don't look like much. You're just this cocoon hanging out with Jesus. But little by little, you begin to develop. And you know what? When you're in that cocoon, what God's whole purpose is, is to build you up, to strengthen you. There's a story of a boy who saw a butterfly in a cocoon. And he wanted to rip the cocoon open because he saw the butterfly stretching in the cocoon and trying to, to, to build the strength. And the boy felt sorry for the butterfly. And the boy was about to tear it open, but his father said, no, son, don't do that. And the boy says, but it looks like he needs help. And the father said, no, son, he doesn't need help. When the time comes when he's strong enough, he's going to rip through that cocoon. But if you rip that cocoon too early, and if the butterfly gives up too early, you're going to damage him and he won't be able to fly. And the boy understood. So he watched the butterfly and waited. And one day when the butterfly was strong enough, it ripped through that cocoon and flew off into the skies. Some of you right now feel like life is hard. You're like, God, I just want to give up. I just want to give up. I, I'm just tired, God. I'm tired. God, why are you allowing me to go through this in life? God, why are you allowing me to go through this trial? And we're only seeing what we're seeing, but we don't see the glory that God has for us. And I'll tell you this morning, some of you might have felt like you were on the brink of giving up, but God says, don't give up or you're going to miss my glory. God wants to transform you and it's going to take time. But I tell you and I promise you, don't give up. If you don't give up, he's going to transform you into something so beautiful that you could have never imagined. I'll tell you right now where you are at right now in life. If you keep walking with God, I promise you, if you keep walking with God one month, two months, one year, two years, three years, you keep walking with him. I'm going to tell you, remember what you look like three years ago? Do you remember what you're doing three years ago? Now look at what you're doing now. I tell you, some of you already blow me away. We're like, I'm looking at you guys just a year ago, and I'm like, wow. Look what God has done in you. And it inspires me because I know that God is not a liar, that what he says is truth. And I've seen transformation in your life. And I've seen how God is blossoming your spiritual life. My thing is this, just don't give up. Just keep moving forward. And I promise you, we'll be here with you. The cornerstone is a family that will be with you every step of the way. When times get tough, through the good and the bad, we'll be right there until God calls us home. Amen? Let's all stand as we pray this morning. Say with me this morning. I believe that I am a new creation. The old has gone and the new has come. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for your word. It's life changing. We know that we don't operate by the flesh, but we operate by the spirit of the living God. And right now, God, we ask for your strength to overcome those fleshly habits, God, those addictions. We ask you to help us overcome that anxiety, that depression. Let us understand and see from your perspective of how beautiful you've created us and that you didn't just save us just to save us and you didn't just forgive us just to forgive us, but that you would call us to be a new creation transform from glory to glory 
So this morning, God, I pray that you would stir up a fire in our hearts. God, not to be mediocre, but God, to be people who push forward and follow you, God. And when the enemy tries to strike, when the enemy tries to attack, we will attack him back with righteousness. So God, help us and convict us in our decisions, in the words that we say, in the how we act towards other people. That give us that window to make the decision to choose righteousness to combat the work of the enemy. Lord, we honor you. And even though we might be, some of us might be going through tough times right now, we understand that there's beauty in the process and that we're not just being renovated. We are being transformed for we are a new creation. We give you all the glory and all the praise in the mighty name of Jesus. And everyone said, Amen and amen. Let's give the Lord a big clap offering.